Shalom, Kedeshim. This is AC here with episode 61, 061. This is an episode that I've taken three segments that I've done in the past. Testimony and episode two. And it's my testimony revisited. It's not the original one, but it's the one that I had to redo. And episode 23 episode 26. These three segments that I've done in the past should give you a good understanding of the person that I am. I sort of made this because these are things I want my children to know. I want them to know that I love them. I love my grandchildren. And I just want them to know the struggle that their dad has been through. Grandpa. Now, their great grandpa. I want them to know that the heritage that I give them is one out of struggle and that it has a lot of joy and a lot of pain. I think you'll enjoy it. To OBA, the Open Bible Association, tell them like it is rebuilding the tabernacle of David that has fallen down. OBA, Open Bible Association, is a Studio 772 production, broadcasting from our home in Grassroots USA. OBA, Open Bible Association, answering the hard questions and being a bridge over troubled water. The troubled water of denominationalism and division in just plain biblical ignorance. By sharing the truth of the Bible and its cultural and historical context, shining the light of understanding on a dark mundane post-Christian atheistic time, reminding people that God cares, and all things are possible with Him. Hey, ask that guy what time it is. Yeah, you, with a stack of Bibles in your hands. What time is it? Can you tell me what time it is? Do you know what time it is? It is Bible time. It's time to get out this Bible, open up the books, start reading some scripture, and let the kingdom of God come into your soul. It's Bible time. Get all excited, folks. Bible time. That's the reading of the word. Opening the scriptures. This whole episode is about moving forward in the journey. It comes with great pain and great joy. Let these verses speak to you. From our trio of King James Version KJV, God's Word to the Nation GW Version, and the Tree of Life Version TLV, straining toward the goal Philippians chapter 3 verses 12 to 14, KJV, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. GW, it's not that I've already reached the goal or have already completed the course, but I run to win that which Jesus Christ has already won for me. Brothers and sisters, I can't consider myself a winner yet. This is what I do, I don't look back, I lengthen my stride, and I run straight toward the goal to win the prize that God's heavenly call offers in Christ Jesus. TLV, not that I have already obtained this or been perfected, but I press on if only I might take hold of that for which Messiah Yeshua took hold of me brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself as having taken hold of this. But this one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal for the reward of the outward calling of God in Messiah Yeshua. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And may he bless you and keep you and give you peace. Shalom. 
Shalom and howdy. This is OBA, Open Bible Association, Episode 2, My Testimony, Remix. I know that's a kind of a wild title. I will explain that. I originally made an Episode 2, My Testimony episode, and I used music in it that wasn't particularly royalty-free. I thought it was royalty-free, but there had to be something I could do with it, and so I got a copyright strike on it, so I decided to totally redo this video. My testimony is not going to change. I still had the same salvation experience that I had in the original video. It may sound a little bit different, but it's actually the same. I'm not using an animated voice. I'm using my voice. And I want you to kind of know me a little bit better. If you're listening to me on a podcast or however that you're listening to me, if you're watching me on a YouTube, I animate my YouTube picture. And on the podcast, I want to use my voice for my speaking parts. And so this is, gives me the opportunity to make my testimony more my own. Although I wrote down exactly what I wanted to say and I had it read for me, it was really planned out, so this is more on the fly and on the cuff. I want you to know my character. I believe this is probably a better way. So my testimony would start out when I was 21 years old, which is 44 years ago, on a fall day, early fall days, a Wednesday in Columbus, Ohio at the Freebus Avenue Church of God. I was in the balcony of a Wednesday night service and they pre I remember the preacher preaching. I can't really tell you what he was preaching about except for it seemed like he was a preaching to a couple people in the first couple rows. I don't even think that he saw or knew or anything about me and I really didn't want to make it in that way. I was sitting there with my aunt and uncle, Mike and Brenda, who had taken me to church. When the preacher said, let's all stand and pray, I stood and prayed. I prayed the only prayer that I know, which was the Lord's Prayer. Now, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, I can finish out quoting that, but I didn't end it with an amen. I ended it with, help me. That is the moment, and that is the minute, and that is the hour, and that is the day that I got saved. People would say, well, you didn't go to the altar when they had the altar call. I can't really help that, but that is the minute and the hour that I got saved. I did go to the altar many times. After that, people had laid their hands on me and they prayed for me and I sought the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I had some really wonderful times at the altar, but that was not the time that I got saved. I got saved standing saying that prayer. Maybe that's theologically wrong, it's real. And, you know, I look at that, maybe there's some wisdom in that. The fact is, there's nothing magic about it, nothing complicated or anything. It's just the simplicity that I believed in God and He gave me salvation. It's just that simple. And that's one thing that I never want to do, is take the simplicity of the gospel out of it. God is not as complicated as we seem to make him sometimes. We seem to make the way way harder than it should. That's not my goal. My goal is I've spent these 44 years learning about him. I've not been a goody-goody person, and I've not been a really bad person. As far as that goes, I've never been extremely tough and God saved me like I was some kind of really ruffian or whatever. And I've never been an angel uh, where I've walked like up in the clouds or whatever. I was just basically a regular person with regular person sins and regular person's desires. And even when I got saved, I've always struggled and life has not been easy. I've never had it easy as far as the way things go went. I had to learn how to make a living, which was rough, but I, I did that. And in this 44 years, I did one thing that I thought was really cool. After I got saved, I met 
Well, actually, she was my Aunt Brenda's, the one that took me to church. Her mother, Sister Nileen Terry, and she gave me some great advice. For some reason, she kind of took me under her shoulder, if you will, under her wing or whatever. And she gave me some mentoring advice that I really took serious. And that was, she said that the Lord told her to read the Bible, read it all the way through, and don't miss a word. And I thought, man, that is great advice. Maybe I could do that. And I did. I read the Bible all the way through. And I had only study book that I had was a American Heritage Dictionary. And when I ran across a word I didn't know, I would look it up until I know it, and I would read the verse again with the understanding of the word that I didn't know, and I'd do it till I ran across another word that I didn't know, which for me wasn't uh, a really long way in the Bible. So I read it through that first time, and then I read it through again, and I started marking things. I give myself a color code. I came up with a color code of marking it and during that journey. Green was for salvation. Orange was for different thing. I forgot exactly what I used the orange for. Blue was from was for the Holy Spirit. So I started giving myself this color code of you know what it was. I went through it like two or three different times. You know it kind of kind of changed the code at some some point so it's not ironclad. That's why I would say oh wait a minute here. What green was for the Godhead. I started marking things like that in one time. And orange was for salvation. So, you know, I kind of changed my color code from time to time, but it wasn't important of how I was marking. It was the fact that I was learning. That was the important part. And then I added something to my study abilities, which was a strong concordance. Started looking up words and finding where words appear and what the definitions were in the Hebrew and the Greek lexicons. I started looking at that kind of stuff. And then I got about four more translations. The churches that I went to were basically King James only churches. I got these four other translations and I started reading them book by book. I would take the book of say Titus and I would read it in all four of these translations and I would try to figure out what the difference was. I would look at all the footnotes and why that they were translated the way that they were. That's how I got my Bible knowledge. That and I also at one point moved to Tennessee here to be closer to my kids. My marriage didn't work out too well. I got married when I was 23. I moved in 2000 to Tennessee to be close to my kids. I had a, I, I really did get to be a, a dad and I was kind of happy about all that. And my kids, um, I got to see my grandkids. They're getting to the place to where they're going to have kids. So I really feel that I've been blessed in that area. When I moved down here, I ended up a long way from people that I know and from everything. And so I ended up moving to Nashville at one point. In that time in Nashville, I got to meet people that you know, on the internet that were pretty well like-minded. Give me some directions on studying and good study materials and good books to read and things like that. So kind of went through that period of learning again. Even whenever I wasn't in Nashville and I moved back, I still had about two and a half hours of driving. So I would listen to radio teachings and things like that. And I'd spend five hours a day still learning without even really thinking about it too much. My knowledge and my wisdom grew to where I am today. And I'm still learning as far as that goes. But there's one thing that I don't think that I can outlearn, and that's the simplicity of the gospel. I don't want to outdo that. I mean, I've learned sacred names. I've learned about the Sabbath. I've learned so many different things. But there's something called the simplicity of the gospel, which I don't want to ever, ever make things too hard to where the simplicity of the gospel just doesn't shine in anything that I give as a testimony or a teaching. Simplicity. God says it, and we can believe it. We may have to seek for some understanding, but the understanding is not going to be so complicated to where you can't find it. And this is my testimony, and I hope that this is enough of me that you would find it interesting to look or listen to the rest of my podcast or YouTube videos that I'm making. And thank you for listening. Shalom and hallelujah, O oh, be it.
Open Bible Association, building up your most holy Kodesh faith and giving you some time to escape the mundane and rest in the Ruach Ha Kodesh in the presence of you who are and Yeshua. Hallelujah and Amen in the name of Yeshua our King, with blessings and love. Be blessed. Shalom and howdy, OBA, episode 23 is on the air, talking about today, unintended consequence. You know, there's, we talked about moves of the Spirit last week, and how that we had different, we had two awakenings, the Great Awakening and then the second Great Awakening. We had the waves, the first wave of Pentecost, the second wave of charismatic renewal and the third wave of, you know the mega churches and such and then even a the fourth wave that isn't officially in the books but i'm calling it that of the sacred name of messianic movements and they you know they all have the roots in earlier moves and such so it's not like they just popped on the scene all at once i mean if i look at the church going downtown, what, what does that actually mean? Well, that means that you have these segmented churches that have doctrines such as Tulip, which is a Calvinist doctrine, and then you have Arminian doctrines of Baptists and so forth. So when the Holy Ghost hits that, they just maintain the doctrines that they had, and they just pick up on the Pentecostal doctrine. But if I look at, like, say, the original Pentecostal movement, you had people from all different kinds of faith that would end up worshiping together. You have Catholics, you'd have Baptists, Nazarenes, and everybody would all seem to be happy worshiping together. But when you get into the charismatic renewal, they become segmented, and that happiness to be together isn't particularly there. So we look at unintended consequences, we never looked at that as an unintended consequence, that the church becomes stag stagnated again. We, we, we didn't look at that in a sort of a strange light, but it kind of happens in different levels of the way that the spirit moves. And there's always unintended consequences for your actions, and sometimes it's hard to see God in all that. But there's one thing that that I rest assured on, and that is that whenever you go through hard times and stuff, maybe could have been avoided because maybe you didn't move exactly in the Spirit. God still looks out for us. Like that old poem about the two, step, two sets of footsteps, and then when we was going through the most trouble, there was only one, and that's because Jesus carried us. And, you know, a, a lot of times in my life I've heard that poem Actually being read, it didn't mean a whole lot. And then at times it meant a whole lot. And generally it's when you're going through these things. And there's always unintended consequences for your actions. I mean, I could go and I look at mine, and maybe this is not the best forum to air all that. You know, being raised by an you know, alcoholic parent that just couldn't say two words without one of them being a cuss word. And then getting saved in, in the way that I got saved when I had so much peace. I had so much shalom, so much peace that I can remember my my mom. She knew everybody knew that the peace that I had, and, and they all coveted that because everything that seemed to be at unrest in my life, in my family, and such. That my mom, she would try to get my alcoholic stepdad to sat in the chair where I sat, thinking that the peace that I had would be in that chair and that would calm him down. I mean, that's just how much peace that I had, that people would just want to you know, touch me to get some of that peace. It's like, wow, that's, that's something to look back on and kind of think and be thankful for and to praise God for. It. And that's a hallelujah thing right there. We, we start looking at, uh, you know, how unintended consequences and maybe our actions and we sometimes we think that we're following the Spirit and we pretty well may be, but we don't know sometimes how that's going to work out in different areas. I mean, 
I was thinking about this, and maybe this isn't the best place to say this, but when I picked my wife, I thought I was picking something that was really good, and she is. I, I don't want to put her down or make this a put down thing. But I remember a prophecy that was given to her about how she would find somebody that would walk with her through life and be there. And I, I tried to be that person, I really did, but that prophecy didn't say that she would be there for me. It just says that I would be there for her, basically, or somebody would, but I kind of assumed it was me. Um, anyways, I looked at the times, so that didn't work out very well for me, so was that an unintended consequence? I believe so. I believe if I would have done things a little bit different, that the consequences would have been different. But ultimately, that doesn't mean that the will of God, you know, the sovereignty of God is that He will have His way regardless. And we look at things like, you know, election and all this other kind of stuff sometimes as being so doctrinally sound that, you know, we, we get caught up in that, well, wait a minute here, there's always this of repentance, and that God can accept your repentance, and so this is what we go on. Maybe we did mess up, and maybe we'll have to pay prices for unintended consequences of things that we've done in the past, but that doesn't hinder us from our salvation. Our salvation is something that didn't come from us originally. It came from God, and that's the way that it's always going to be. I know I've kind of got on to uh, folks in previous episodes talking about unmerited favor. My whole thing is, it isn't unmerited if Jesus died for it. And this is the merit, not on my own merit, but on His merit. You know, it boils down to that in basic terms. That there were actions that were actually done, and consequences for that that were purposely done, such as salvation. This is why Jesus suffered the way that he suffered on the cross, and why that he rose from the dead and was justifying us in the Spirit at that time for the things that we done, not the things that he done. He, he justifies himself. It's because he was justified that we're justified. And as we talk about atonement and all this other kind of stuff, which I believe in, I fully believe in, a, a, the atonement of Yeshua on the cross. But we have to understand the temple language a little bit more to fully appreciate this. But in the long run is we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. The wheel has already been invented. So we hook it onto the cart, we load the cart down, and we pull the cart, we do all the stuff that we're supposed to do with the wheel. You know, at the end of the day, it just boils down to God is sovereign, and He knows the beginning from the end. He knows everything, and He tries to work things out for our good. And sometimes that's a really hard thing to see because of unintended consequences. It's like a, we were talking about the um, Pentecostal movement, that first wave, how that you had very little form and fashion when it came to worship and church ordinances and such. I mean, there was no liturgy or anything like that that you could really say. It was basically praise and worship and preaching and prayer time. And it was all good and great. We look at, uh, say, maybe in Catholicism and other type of high church rituals and such that you would have a lot of liturgy and things like that. But really, I'm not a liturgical person. I really don't particularly like the liturgy of, say, the Catholic Church. I mean, it seems kind of weird to me, but there's some people that kind of like that stuff for some reason. When we start looking at, say, that fourth move where they're putting in things like, okay, liturgy, but it's coming out of the synagogue. It's very interesting to see a tour, a tour service for that they're marching the door now. But it's actually opening up the scriptures in a way that hasn't been opened up before. And it's really interesting to see that and to hear the blessings and to be blessed and such the way that, you know, the liturgy of the synagogue was. The majority of Christian people never even really knew about 
understood it or whatever. But it's really been interesting to see that all happen. So we get, we get into this and it's like, okay, for every consequence, there's always a, a negative thing, it seems. Like, okay, we have unintended consequences. And so in these unintended consequences, does that make the intended consequences worthwhile? I would have to say that it does. And I am so thankful for the things that God has done for me and in my life, even though that they've been really hard at times. God has always had mercy, and His peace passes all understanding. And I am really thankful for that. If I never say anything else, I would have to say hallelujah, praise Yeshua, praise His holy name for the shalom that He has given me in my lifetime. And I am so thankful that, for that. I mean, I'm, it's been 40, 44 years and counting that I've felt this peace. And sometimes I've taken it for granted. God forgive me for taking that for granted because it is so precious and in this world today not everybody has that peace which is available to them and this, this is the thing that we try to stress and push. We have a peace with Yeshua that passes all understanding that is available for the asking. It's not something that you have to beat out of God, which you couldn't anyway. Your arms are too short to box with God. But it's something that is freely available to you. It is the shalom. I mean, I love the gifts. I, I mean, I, I love the, you know, speaking in tongues and prophecy and all these kinds of things. The, the you know, word of wisdom and word of knowledge. And I love to hear good preaching, teaching, and the such. But there is nothing that can compare with the peace of God. Especially when you're in such turmoil of this world today. This is a very wicked and evil world that we live in today. It seems like love and everything that you would say are qualities that people should be embracing today that they don't particularly embrace and that they've twisted them into something that they, there isn't. When they say love today, do they really mean the kind of love that God has? I don't think that they do, to be quite honest with you. But I would like to conclude this with a blessing. May the God of heaven and all glory grant unto you his peace, his shalom. OBA, Open Bible Association is on the air with the good news of the gospel, shining the light on folks, letting them know they do not have to walk in darkness, breaking generational curses, and bringing blessings to a dark and troubled world, letting people know the kingdom of God is in their grasp, teaching them how to reach out and take it by faith. Amen. Shalom. Here we are with episode 26. One more song for him. Seemed like last week I made the uh, last episode, episode 25, standing on the rock looking back. It seemed like I did that in like a day and I thought I was going to be ahead and all that. But then I get to Friday and I really haven't done anything but maybe make a few bumpers. So in doing that and saying that, I kind of thought I was losing my eyesight there for a while. And it was really a scary time for me. But I'm going to get to make another one, another video. And that's kind of like, this is one more for Yeshua. When I'm looking at this from the standpoint that I am, maybe it's a good thing because sometimes you can get emotionally charged and your emotions can mask the Spirit of God into something that maybe it's not particularly sane or wanting. Example of that would be, I remember when I first became a believer, I read the Bible as my testimony would tell you. I read it clear through. And some of the ideals that I got from it was 
When you get to the judges, I was looking at two people in there quite extensively, and one of them was Japatha. Japatha is mentioned in the book of Hebrews, but it doesn't go into any great details of it. And then the next one is Samson. Ideal of Samson and Delilah was Samson was kind of like a Hercules figure, really strong, killed a lot of people with the jawbone of an axe, and he's famous for that. But the whole thing is, I always felt, well, what is up with this guy? You know, he's so in, you know, with the Spirit of God and so strong, and he was put here to judge the Philistines, and he gets entangled with a Philistinian woman. That just didn't seem right, but he loved her, he really did, and she was out to get him, and so what does he do? He kind of gets a little closer to the truth, you know, he doesn't tell her exactly where he thinks his power is at. He thinks it's in his hair, but he tells him, yeah, if you braid it seven times and stuff. Eventually he does tell her, and she has his hair cut, and he's blinded and put into a place, you know, a prison. And then he's on display, and his hair is grown back, and he kills more Philistines in his death than he did in his life. That was his purpose here. God saw his purpose through. But my thing is about Japatha. Japatha was one of these people that I can relate to in a different way is coming from the background that I have and the family that I have. They use a lot of cuss words and swear words and such and say some really goofy things at times. And I, so I can relate to Japatha because he had some of the same kind of qualities, I guess. He actually did something that I, I have preached on a few times, and I'm really not a preacher. I really didn't think that my ministry, I knew I had one, but I didn't think it would be like, you know, a pastor or a teacher or a prophet or any of the fivefold ministry. I never thought that it would be that. In that time, I kept looking for it kept waiting for it and all this stuff, but it never did come to pass because it wasn't my time. My ministry, I know what it is now. I'm a restoration preacher. I'm a restoration preacher, and I, that's what I do, is trying to restore the gospel back to what it was in the book of Acts and bring it to this 21st century in a way that people can understand it. That's my mission in life. As a young Christian, and a believer, I studied the Bible and I came across Japatha. So I'm reading about him and I kind of stumbled onto these facts. As one, Japatha, in his bragging and stuff, he actually made a statement that cost him something dear. Now, some people would say he didn't actually kill her. Some say that he put her into a home and she never had children and such like that, put her into like a convent or something, you know, only they didn't have that type of thing at that time. He says, he prays and he says, Yehovah, Yahweh, Jehovah, however you want to pronounce his name, Yahuwah, if you let me win this battle, I will kill the first person that comes out of my house. And so, he didn't have to say that. He didn't have to make a promise like that. But the Lord heard his word. When he came home, who is the first person he sees? His daughter, his only child, the daughter that he loves. And he didn't have to do that. And, and I was thinking as being a young Christian, you know, I would pray these prayers like, God, I'll do everything for you. I'll do exactly what you want. God, I'll give up family for you. I'll give up you know, wives and children and family and stuff. And I really didn't know what I was saying because I didn't have to say that. And so I got myself in trouble in the same way that Japatha got himself in trouble. Because I look at my life and I look at how my wife and I got along and how that didn't work and stuff. But I remember one time we lived on Whittier Avenue and I'm laying in the bed and my kids are about three, they're twins, right? And I had my, my stepdaughter, she's a couple years older than her. She was about six, I think. And then I had two cats and my wife, my, we was all in this big bed that we had. And the kids, they at nighttime they like to travel, so they came into the bed there with me and my wife and the cats were in the bed. And I woke up, it's real bright, shiny. I can remember the sun coming through the window. And I looked and I just felt so content and happy. And then I heard that still, small voice. And I felt the anointing of God and it said, enjoy this because it won't last. And I didn't want to hear that. I, I really didn't want to hear that. The way things went, the marriage kind of went down. And I remember 
that we'd separated. And about a year later, I get a letter from her saying, I don't want to be double married anymore. I prayed about it and I thought about it. So I go to court. My mom doesn't want me to go to court to get a divorce. I really didn't want to get a divorce. I I cried there. My mom cried there. We didn't really want to do it, or I didn't want to do it, and she didn't want me to do it either, but I did it. I did it because I loved God, and I felt like, well, if that's his plan for her, I don't don't believe this. I don't believe that uh, what she's saying is actually true. Uh, That is the Pentecostal way, or at least in some circles that's the way, but it really wasn't the way that I saw Scripture. At the end of the day, I had to say, I will give you up for God, and I did. I didn't want to do that, but I did. So God held me to that promise that I made. I will give up wives and kids and all this stuff for you. And he held me to that promise. And I didn't know what, I didn't want to hear any of that stuff, but but I did. So sometimes we can get ourselves in trouble, not so much by the evil and bad things that we do, although we probably do that a lot and have to repent and everything, but sometimes we can get ourselves in trouble for our prayer life. We pray the wrong things. We shouldn't be asking for temptations and trials. We should be praying that prayer that is in the otherwise known as the Lord's Prayer. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That is the prayer that we should be praying. As a young Christian and dumb, that was the kind of prayer I didn't pray. And so I had to face the reality of that. I wish I wouldn't have. I really, really wish that I would. I didn't want anything like that to happen. I felt like I was a believer and that, you know, we could do great things. When I, when I married my wife, I, I loved her. She was really talented with playing the piano and I figured that, hey, we could do something great. I didn't know what. And I still don't know what all the good things could happen and sometimes I do and it just kind of like sinks my spirits way down low because is not any of that. I stand on the goodness of God that he knows what he's doing. So it's my hope that maybe these shows that I make reach somebody and keep them from doing some of the things that I did that weren't the best thought out plans, such as you have to realize that God answers prayer. And so how that you pray may have a lot to do with the success in your life or the failures as well. Like I said, you don't want to pray for temptations. You want to prepare to be able to face temptation, but you also have to pray the prayer, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine will is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. So everything that we do needs to be pointing up and not at ourselves. Because when I prayed that prayer, God, I'll do this, that made it selfish. And so when God heard my prayer and he put these things on me the way that they were, it was because of my own self. So in a way which I I'm praying, you know, I prayed, it's like, okay, this was God's way of delivering me from myself. I am still grateful for all the things that I have, and so the lessons that I've learned are really ironclad and in there. I remember that my daughter, whenever I told her that I was going to get baptized in the name of Yeshua, she cried because she thought I was falling into something evil. And I also remember when my mother said, when I said I'm getting baptized in the Church of God in water. She cried also when, whenever she knew she felt like she lost me. It was a sincere prayer and she had a lot of confidence and faith in me, but when my daughter did this, she thought I was falling into some evil cult or something, you know? And so it's a lot different because I never did that to get saved because I felt that I already was. There was nothing that that could offer me except for moving more into the truth. I know that God has a name. And if we look back at those spiritual movements, if you look back at the uh, second wave of holiness, his name came out of the holiness movement. I mean, if you look at the Jehovah Witnesses, which I'm not a Jehovah Witness, don't 
ever want to be one. But how do you think that they came up with that? They found that, well, let's see, over 5,000 times, his name is in the Bible, and it's kind of like put in there with Lord. I don't see a problem with using the word Lord, but if you ask the majority of people, well, if God has a name, they think that that is his name. They think that Jesus' name is Jesus and that, you know, he is not the person that the Bible really says that he is. And so this is the problem. A lot of this came out of that second wave also of the circuit writers and the uneducated preachers that all they had was the King James Bible and faith. And they did a great and a fantastic job of spreading the gospel to America in the rural areas and every everything. I mean, they actually is some of the things that made America great is their preaching. They, they built families and communities and things like that. And then when we get the first wave of Pentecostalism, when after people started really getting sincere and wanting to bring back the book of Acts, you also start getting the end of a lot of prejudicing things that we had built up here of separation. They really, the people really did more to integrate than ever the melting pot. I don't care where you was, what color you was, or anything. When it came to the Holy Ghost, you are all same and welcome. But whenever it moves on downtown in that second wave, it kind of gets back to segmented and so forth. You know, the whole thing is we don't have to take all the negative things out. We can take the positive things that, and dwell on them and use what we need to bring us to this 21st century and the way that we should go. Like I was saying in one of these videos, we looked at the seven churches of Asia in a very brief way, and we found out that some people view these as church ages. We, if we was to look at it in that sense, the Laodicean church would be the last church. The Laodicean church, Laodicea comes from some Greek words that means people's ecclesia or people's congregation. They didn't do a very good job of teaching, did they? I mean, if you look, they were saying that they were rich. Well, we have prosperity preachers today coming out of that third wave, and they are saying they're rich. They have need of nothing. Yeshua, or the Spirit, tells them that they're poor. They need to buy riches tried in fire, and they don't particularly know what he's talking about. They, he, they tell them that we're clothed, and he says, no, you're naked. And he says, buy a me white raiment, or get white raiment. And he says, well, we see, and he tells them that they're blind and miserable to anoint their eyes with eye salve that they might see. Everything that they were claiming, he actually came against them for. And in a way, that's what's happening today in the church world. So if that Laodicean church is the church age, and we went back and looked at some of the other ages, which could represent some of the other denominations that you see today. Well, we look at where they have split themselves up into the clergy, the people, and that didn't work out very well either. Either way that you go, you can have all these things, a lot of steps in between. The only one that he really had any really good things to say was the ones that were going to die. So I, I'm not praying that we are, want need to be put into that kind of a peril peril to where that we're in danger with our lives and stuff. But what I am saying that we ought to heed to what the Spirit says to the churches. And this is something that you don't particularly find. People get upset on some of the strange things for weird reasons. And this is what I'm called to do is to say, hey, wait a minute here. The Spirit of God is telling us exactly what we need to do. But people just are not listening. The name of the Lord, Yahweh, Yahuwah, however that you'd want to say it or not say it, is a strong tower. It can't hurt you. Keeping His commandments, the secret of keeping His commandments is there isn't 613 laws that anybody has to do. There isn't that. That's just garbage teaching. The ideal is that you have to keep the laws that apply to you. I can't keep the laws of a woman. I can't even keep the laws of a Hebrew or a Jewish man. Why? Because I'm not. 
I have to keep the laws. Am I keeping no hide laws? I go back to the chapter 15th chapter of Acts and I start looking and it seems to be kind of what like Christian Noahide, what, what he tells them to do, not eat things strangled and such. So when we look at some of the teachings of Paul, we have things to do. If you, whatever that you do, do, that's right. My thing is, I don't think I'll ever be in Jerusalem. I don't think I'll ever be in Israel. If God puts me there, then I would have to do those things. But until then, I don't have to do that. The ideal of that kind of like gets thrown over by the majority of people, whether they be denominationalized or whatever. One thing that I cannot do is come against anybody that is doing what God said. I can't do that. I can't come against them in any way, shape, or manner. And so I have to say, okay. I have to agree sometimes to disagree, but that doesn't mean that, I, like I said, the key to this is and I've said this before, all the Bible was written for you, but it isn't all to you. And this is something that a lot of people just don't understand. So I think I'll leave it at that and just say, God, I thank you for your word. And I thank you for the ability that you're giving me to line up to it. And amen. And lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. Realize what he says in the next verses. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven and that we're looking for the kingdom of God and so in the kingdom of God kingdom rules have to apply so you can't divide kingdom rules and say okay I'm not going to do this because this is Old Testament or this is archaic or whatever you can say well wait a minute here does this apply to me so that's the big difference and I'm going to close for that and say Shalom and leave you with the blessing. The blessing is may the God of heaven, may Yahuwah, open up your eyes and show you what his will is for you on this earth today. And may he give you a spirit of understanding that you may know his will. In Yeshua's name, I pray this prayer. Amen. OBA, Open Bible Association, answering the hard questions and being a bridge over troubled water. The troubled water of denominationalism and division, and just plain biblical ignorance. By sharing the truth of the Bible and its cultural and historical context. Shining the light of understanding on a dark mundane post-Christian atheistic time. Reminding folks that God cares and all things are possible with Him. Hello, this is AC, or AC's Corner, and I don't think it would be fair not to say that in this episode 061 is a sort of a tell-all thing, and it tells you exactly the person that I am, some of the struggles that I went through, and the ideal is not so much about me, and the fact is the salvation that Jesus freely gives, that God freely has provided, doesn't mean there isn't a struggle and that your life may seem to be going bad, but at the end of the day, none of this stuff really matters. You can't lay up treasures here on this earth and think that you're going to take them with you. We lay up treasures in heaven because that's where our eternal home is going to be. And I hope that you've got my message and that you understand. And thank you for listening. For those of you that are not family, thank you for listening. And I'm sure that you know, similar things, similar circumstances can find you in some of the same ways that I went through in my 66 plus, or yeah, 66 plus years now. And thank you. Oh.
OBA, Open Bible Association, shining the light on a sin-sick world, giving them the message of Yeshua, the message of hope. Shalom. Hallelujah. We are so glad you was here with us in this episode. We hope that this program has been a blessing to you that we have given you some time to take your mind off this complicated mundane wicked world and to take you to the sacred and Kaddish kingdom of God, if only for this moment in time in the spirit of Ruach HaKadosh. If you have any topics or concerns you can find our links to our positive solutions, feel no better Facebook page, drop us a line there. Our link to all our endeavors can be found at our website, studio772.com. If we have been a blessing to you, give us a like and subscribe. We would love to hear from you. As always, thank you for listening. May the Almighty keep you protected and guide you, and give you shalom. Yeshua, he steadfastes all understanding. We pray this prayer in Yeshua's authority. Amen. OBA Open Bible Association is a Studio 772 production, broadcasting from our home in Grassroots USA.